Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next seminar of the Ocean Plastic webinar series. So we're really excited today to have Lynn with us. And before we go into introducing Lynn, um, my name is Daphne Lebel. I'm from Utrecht University, and I'll be moderating this session. And you can also go to Slido um, already right now. You can just type in sli.do. And the hashtag is OPW for Ocean Plastic Webinars. And there you can ask all your questions. And if you have some, if you see some questions from the other uh, participants that you would like to hear the answer to, you can upvote those, those questions. So you just click on, um, click next to that, that question and it will come to the top of our list so that we know to, to ask Lynn those questions. So I will give a short introduction um, of uh, Lynn, and then um, the floor will be uh, headed, yeah, turned over to you, Lynn. So Ms. Sorrentino holds an MSc in Marine Environmental Protection from Bangor University from 2018. She is currently a project officer within IUCN's Global Marine and Polar Team in Switzerland. She is part of the IUCN Close the Plastic Tap program, um, and she currently manages plastic pollution hotspotting projects, including policy and circular economy aspects. She supports the IUCN Plastic Waste Free Islands project in Antigua and Barbuda, um, Grenada, St. Lucia, Fiji, Samoa, and Vanuatu. She has worked in conservation since 2011 and has been a scuba diving, uh, has been scuba diving since 1987. All right, so thank you so much, Lynn, for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much, Delphine. And let me share my screen to yeah. start off. You can go right ahead. Okay, let me put this into presentation mode. Uh, welcome everybody and thank you for attending. I look forward to your questions in about 30 minutes or so. Um, so as Delphine mentioned, my name is Lynn Sorrentino. I am with the IUCN Close the Plastic Tap program inside of the ocean team now. Um, we are working on reorganizing a little bit. So our name has actually changed from Global Marine and Polar to Ocean Team. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about from measurement to action, how to close the plastic tap. So first, for some of you in the audience that may not know about IUCN, I'd like to give you a short introduction. The International Union for Conservation of Nature is a membership union. It's composed of governments and civil society organizations. We have approximately 18,000 scientific experts working across six science commissions. We have 1,400 member organizations, which include nonprofits, non governmentals, indigenous peoples organizations, etc. We work with 211 states and government members, and we're active in over 160 countries. We operate across 11 regions as well. So now, IUCN's Close the Plastic Tap program was started about seven years ago, eight years ago almost. And we have projects in 17 countries across five regions of the um, planet. We have been operating on about 13 million of funding in the last seven years across different um, organizations that have supported us, including CETA and NORAD and private foundations as well. Our aim of the program is really to take science-based knowledge and integrate that into policy changes, business changes, um, using our tools and methods to measure plastic pollution and then taking all of those measurements and doing something with it that is actionable to close the plastic tap. The standards that we're setting include um, methodologies on how to properly do a plastic pollution assessment for a national or local level. Uh, we engage with the private sector as well, and our aim really is transformational action. So that's sort of the big picture of what we do. What we have produced and what we promote is our science portfolio. We have an expanding knowledge base um, of materials on plastic footprinting, plastics um, in the oceans, what's happening in the Mediterranean, how to use the UNEP IUCN um, methodology to do a plastic hotspotting assessment, et cetera. So a few of the publications that are listed here um, are shown in the images there. The strategy that we have around our 
um, knowledge base is that we are trying to address the key drivers of plastic leakage. And we're trying to also move from a linear to a circular economic system and systems that are socially inclusive. So it's more than beach cleanups, it's more than ocean cleanups. It's actually a combined holistic program approach that offers tools and solutions to deal with plastic pollution in rivers and in the marine environment. So we aim to do this by again, leveraging our members, our government um, members, our partners to inform and influence public policy, corporate policies, um, operations. Um, we have, for example, a corporate tool called the PLP that we have developed in conjunction with Qantas. It's actually Qantas um, is the owner of the PLP. It's called Plastic Leak Project, but it's a tool that takes the plastic hotspotting to a corporate level and analyzes value chains so that corporations can understand where plastic is leaking across their value chains and then address it. So again, we work with multiple stakeholders to make these changes. Um, as I showed before, we are developing lots of knowledge products, methods, assessments, synthesis, analysis of policies and economics, et cetera. And the aim again is to get that knowledge out there and share it across different stakeholders to influence change. And really our program, I think, as I've said over the last couple of slides is to promote learning, to promote circular economy, to develop knowledge that gets shared, to inform and influence, and to extend the life cycle of plastics. You know, and think about how do we really reduce plastic leakage into the environment by all of these approaches being part of a program. Now, I'd like to get into a little bit of detail in the next several slides and specifically talk to you a little bit about some of the outcomes we've seen some, with some of our projects. Um, this is where I'm hoping you'll have lots of questions about um, because this is the super exciting part of what we do. So we have, through several of our projects, um, identified plastic pollution hotspots um, in Kenya, Mozambique, South Africa, Tanzania, Thailand, Vietnam, the Republic of Cyprus, and Menorca, Spain. And what we've done when we say we've identified a plastic pollution hotspot, we've created these um, national level assessments with our partners Quantas EA to, and UNEP to identify mismanaged waste, polymers leaking into the environment, the sectors that are causing the leakage, the applications that are causing the leakage, if it's packaging or tires, et cetera, um, and the geographic um, side of things, which is where you see this map here, which is the Kenya map. And this is mismanaged waste, um, the map and interpretation of that in Kenya currently based on our research that we did in 2020. So these reports are all available online and I'm happy to go into them later and share a little bit more. Um, but the aim of these reports was to really look at the whole view of what was happening in a country and where plastic was leaking and what was causing it. What has come out of this, the methodology and the point of the research really was to look at who was responsible in terms of, you know, like where are things happening and how do we influence them? How do we change things? How do we take the information we now know that there's poly uh, polymers, for example, leaking into, um, you know, specific rivers in Kenya? How do we take that then up to our stakeholders, which happen to be the National Steering Committee, including government agencies? And how do we make sure that they can implement that into a policy that will address the plastic pollution problem? So our outcomes, once we identified all of these hotspots, we've produced a story map and we've produced some other outcome reports on our website to talk about the influence that we've had on the different um, stakeholders. You know, whether it's a local government, whether it's a national government, whether it's a waste management facility, et cetera. How are they developing plastic action plans to deal with marine litter in their countries? All of the countries we've worked with are now creating or have created action plans to address marine litter. 
because of this work that we've been doing. And so it's taken some time and certainly some, um, some real intense science and translation of that science, but it's getting to the point where people are very interested in now saying, okay, these are the interventions we need. So again, our outcomes are again, focused on the variety of stakeholders. Um, as you can see in the chart, um, one of the plastic projects we've had called Mar Plastics has influenced um, government stakeholders, private sector, intergovernmental organizations, nonprofits, business network organizations, or network organizations like Plastics Pats or um, the Business Council on Sustainable Development organizations, um, academics, etc. We have um, performed a hot spotting, or sorry, um, an outcome harvesting um, assessment across this project and some of the others that we're working on so that we can see where things are changing on the ground. Um, who's changing? What kind of capacity has been built? How do we say, okay, we have this circular economy project. How do we measure its effectiveness and its impact and it's the changes that are happening? And how do we ensure that the businesses that are engaged in our work can actually reduce plastic leakage? We do this through outcome harvesting and through monitoring of our projects um, on a regular basis throughout the project. And again, there's a link on the slide um, and these slides will be available afterwards too so that you can go to some of the links and see more. The um, outcomes that we have, for example, in another project of ours called Plastic Waste-Free Islands are improved knowledge again about waste generation among six SIDS. And those are again, Fiji, Vanuatu and Samoa, Antigua and Barbuda, St. Lucia and Grenada. And the aim of this project again is enhancing the adoption of leakage reduction measures in specifically tourism, fisheries and waste management. And then looking at that through the lens of how to create alternative value chains. How do we develop those and increase jobs and change again, the plastic pollution situation on the ground? So that's an exciting project that's going on through this year and is supported by NORAD. So another aspect of our work that is part of, again, our holistic solutions package is to look at what are the economic impacts of plastic pollution and what does that mean for a nation or a local area? How do you know what the damage is that's being done? So we have done uh, some economic research on fisheries in Thailand and Mozambique. We've done research on economics related to the tourism revenue in South Africa and its employment issues related to that. If you have clean beaches that are you know, inviting to tourists, you're going to have more tourism revenue. And so we've done quite a significant um, in-depth assessment of the economic dimensions of what does this mean? You know, if you have a lot of plastic polluting your environment, it's not just about human health, it's about marine ecosystem health, riverine systems, health, biodiversity, food security, employment, um, export revenues, et cetera. And we've looked at things like the efficiency of the different solutions. Like for example, if you have a beach cleanup planned, how is that going to be improved by having a deposit refund scheme? We've had enough now, I think, research in three or four countries that shows if you combine a lot of these efforts for interventions, you do get better results. You get better economic results and better overall results for the environment. So one of the things I briefly mentioned earlier was again, our policy work. Um, and all of the work we've been doing in terms of um, hotspotting and policies and things like that comes with tutorials on how to learn plastic hotspotting, videos to guide users through the process, how to identify the policy instruments or general instruments to use to prioritize the interventions to address plastic pollution. And again, how to link all of these things together. So if you've got a set of interventions, such as sustainable reduction or consumption, et cetera, how do you identify those interventions and prioritize them? 
how do you then implement that? How do you adjust the policy? How do you you know, create a new policy? How do you implement it on the ground to see it happening? So we provide a lot of this guidance and um, hopefully um, positive learning materials that will help people go through the whole process of identifying and questioning the, you know, the situation and understanding how to then change the situation on the ground. So it's all linked together again as as a progress or a process of moving the plastic pollution agenda forward so that we can actually close the plastic tap. Um, in terms of science to policy changes, we have had one really huge success in our Vietnam program. And that's the um, image you see on the, the bottom there, the decision in Vietnam through the Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development in 2021, a year ago, actually this week, they have approved the action plan for marine plastic waste management for the fishery sector for 10 years, 2020 to 2030. And we had a small amount of influence on this through the MAR Plastics Project, but we've done policy assessments for seven of the countries that we work in. And we take those policy assessments and either go further in depth into a particular instrument, like for example, EPR, Extended Producer Responsibility, or look at you know, specific sectors like tourism, fisheries, waste management. So again, communicating the science to policy, um, that needs to be done very clearly and it needs to be done you know, in very, easy to understand language that you can show a policymaker and a decision maker, you know, what will happen for the better if you do X. And so that's part of what is exciting about this project or, or this program overall is that we do provide, you know, so much guidance and so much that we can actually then leverage for real change to close the plastic tap. And with that, I would like to say thank you. I know it's been a short presentation, but um, it does give us, I think, about 45 minutes to actually have questions. And so I'm happy to stop sharing my screen and take questions. Great, thank you so much, Lynn. That was super informative. And yeah, I know that you say it's it was it was short, but I think it's sometimes nice to have you know this this overview that's that's quite quick, and then seeing which parts people want some more information about. So, yeah, I I personally would love to actually see um, you know if if there's one of these examples of these reports that you would like to go into a bit more detail about. So I know that you had these case studies like in Kenya. And so I don't know if you want to maybe share your screen again and, and sure. open up one of these reports and see us, show us what these, these actually look like. Um, yeah. Let me share my screen. So what I'll show you now is the National Guidance for Plastic Pollution Hotspotting and Shaping Action. In, mm -hmm. yeah. So again, this was through our work with UNEP, the Lifecycle Initiative, um, the government of Kenya, uh, the National Environmental Ministry, and Quanta CA. And these reports are all available online on the IUCN website, um, as well as on the UNEP Plastic um, Pollution website through the Lifecycle Initiative. These reports are all quite long. So you can see, for example, the national engagement who was engaged and who contributed to the work. And we start each of these reports, we have eight available um, with a summary at a glance. And again, a 93 page report is not something that any policymaker is gonna wanna do. <laughs> so we do try yeah. to you know, summarize these things. We've um, you know, shortened things for policymakers, et cetera, so that they have an overview and then they can actually you know, think about implementing it with that knowledge and not having to read 93 pages. But our research um, developed this um, summary at a glance, which shows you in Kenya, there is a 92% mismanaged rate of waste. Basically. Wow. It's really high. I mean, this is, this is the case across most countries, to be honest, the, the mismanagement and management rates are, yeah. are quite um, complex. So we, we also noticed there is a 27% collection rate mm -hmm. and only 8% of that was collected for recycling. And um, there's only a 7% domestic recycling rate in Kenya. Um, 
we have noticed in the hotspots, which I was referring to throughout my presentation, the hotspots are in Kenya, and I hope you can see this. Let me see if I can make it a little bigger. Um, I think that's fine. Okay. That polypropylene, PET bottles, polyester, LDPE are the most critical polymers. Um, the numbers of hotspots per waste management stage are also listed here. So the waste management stages are from waste generation, segregation, collection, leakage while waiting for collection, waste related behaviors, um, littering, et cetera, and then waste management infrastructure. So this kind of gives you an idea of where the hotspots are occurring within the cycle. Um, and four cities within Kenya are responsible for 40% of the overall plastic leakage in the country. Wow. Mm. Yeah. And um, can I can I ask a quick question? I think this is linked to one of the questions that someone has has already asked. But um, where um, what's what's the kind of foundation of the data that is used uh, to get to these numbers? Oh, okay, great. Let me skip down to that. And <laughs> As scientists, we're always interested in the numbers. <laughs> yes, of course, and I'm happy to. You can see these reports have lots of charts and yeah, lots. yeah. The hot spotting guidance that we've produced with UNEP is it provides a set of tools that are available on the, I can actually um, share that as well. It's, they're available on the UNEP website, mm -hmm. hot spotting. But the tools are a set of Excel spreadsheets and modeling through Python that mm -hmm. generate all of these um, reports, et cetera, et cetera. But you as a user would go through those Excel sheets and you would put in, let me show you the data. Um, Oh, it's, it's really, um, yeah, thorough. thorough so a lot of the data comes from Comtrade, from the right. or Comtrade um, sites, um, yeah. national data that might not be available on Comtrade that's available to the user. Mm -hmm. But you're plugging in as a user into this tool set, um, you know, the data that, you're, that you have available and the Excel sheets, as well as the models, will then do the calculations and create the graphs that you're seeing in the, in the actual reports. Mm -hmm. And so the data comes from um, population data, it comes from um, the mapping data that we have, it comes from, again, palm trade um, data, yeah. data, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I see that there's there are lots of questions that are coming up, but there's one that is actually um, related to what you've, what you've just said. Mm -hmm. So this mismanaged waste, how is that defined? So, you know, I, I'm, I know that we, we discussed briefly uh, before this, this webinar that, you know, I've, I've also been looking into the UN country data and the, the fact that, you know, from the World Bank, you get the, these reports on each country's mismanagement um, of municipal solid waste. So I was wondering if it was the same. Well, so we did include in all of our reports too, um, sort of glossary of definitions of how we are, um, we're using these terms. And in this case, it's defined as the sum of uncollected and improperly disposed waste. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and, and improperly disposed. So, you know, I, I think this is probably uncontrolled landfills. It's, um, yeah, it's not sent to a, a particular treatment plant, exactly. right? So, yeah. Exactly. Dump sites, unsanitary landfills, mm -hmm. um, large quantities of waste being deliberately disposed somewhere that is not appropriate basically right yeah so something something that is yeah is not contained basically um yeah okay um great so uh i will look through the the questions now i some of them might be related to this report and some of them might be related to your your whole presentation but i'll go to the one that has the most likes for now so this is a, a question from Audrey, one of the other organizers of Ocean Plastic Webinar, and, and she's asking about the, the size of the plastic. So um, whether you are looking at all sizes, so basically, you know, larger than this typical five millimeters that is used to define microplastic, if you're also looking at the smaller sizes that are smaller than five millimeters. Um, generally, it's microplastics, so it's the five millimeter, and it's the broken down size. We haven't done any research within IUCN yet on nanoplastics, um, and we do look at you know general plastic waste though. So, mm -hmm. but it's not um, we haven't gone down to that further level of of detail yet. 
Okay, so it's it's mainly kind of litter items that can be identified and you know, packaging litter, et cetera, et cetera, and then also the mic, uh, the microplastic level as well. Okay, yeah. and do you know how the the difference? So, for example, with the microplastic, it, it might not be, you know, the the data might not be collected in the same way as the as the macro as these these big items. So, do you know how how the data are kind of compiled for those? Yes. Things? So again, um, let me just go down here to show you a little bit more of when we look at, so collecting those, when we look at the different types of plastic, um, I guess segments is what, I don't know if that's the right word to call it, but um, at polymer level. So we are looking at data around polymer level mm -hmm. and you know, as well as sectors that are involved, applications, like again, packaging, things like that, and um, waste management, as well as the geography, um, regional levels. So the Excel tools that we're using, which let me actually um, open up, this, um, let me open up this particular um, set of tools. They're on this website, which is National Guidance for Plastic Pollution Hotspotting. Mm -hmm. there are, um, modules and tools in here, these are Excel spreadsheets that are downloadable. And it gives you in each module what you're going to be measuring, whether it's going to be polymers, um, you know, plastic flows um, that you will need for each of the calculations. There are a set of tools that you can download, tools and modules um, all the way through um, six. And they are technical modules. The T modules are technical modules. So this is again, where you're looking at um, environmental impacts, you're looking at GIS models, you're looking at the sectors that are contributing, et cetera. And we also have some strategic modules that allow for looking at the bigger picture of what's happening and how to create actionable hotspots and interventions for actions. So, so in terms of collecting the data and looking at it, all of these tools and modules walk a user through everything they're gonna to need to know to look at the entire picture of hotspots within a country or a local, um, a local area. Right, yeah. Okay, great. Question. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, really, uh, I, yeah, I, I think it's it's it will be really interesting to look into uh, this website and look at all of these these different modules for yeah, depending on on people's projects and and their aims, right? So yeah, really interesting. Uh, okay, let me go on to the next question. Um, so, uh, did you include waste that comes in from other countries in your calculations and your management recommendations? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, with, for example, within Kenya, um, let me look through here real quick. We do look at export and import numbers. Um, and not, for example, in Kenya, more than 98% of the plastic that is consumed in Kenya is imported mm -hmm. in the form of products or in the form of primary virgin plastic. Um, we as you can see, there's 63 hits on imports here. <laughs> the, the reports do get into that because, you know, this is a this is one of the bigger problems that we're facing, and it's something that we will face as well with the Global Plastics Treaty that's that's coming. Um, is import and export. You know, if you are a country that is exporting all of its plastic waste to a country with no infrastructure that's just not going to work anymore. We need mm. to fix that. And so, yeah, imports and exports are definitely something we do consider and how those materials are used or disposed of or upcycled or waste, wasted, et cetera. So I see you have both the import and export of actual products and also waste mm -hmm. in your, your model. So yeah. Okay. Great. All right. Um, and uh, yeah, as I mean, as an oceanographer, I'm also interested if um, this is also trying to, to look at kind of the, well, yeah, this, this might be kind of beyond your scope, but to integrate, you know, whether the, the, what's found, for example, on the beaches can come from other countries, right? So it's transported by the currents and yeah, it's, it's basically brought onto an, a foreign land that where the origin of that, that litter does not come from that, that country, right? So yeah, this is 
part of what you know our team is, is trying to look into but I'm, I'm wondering if this could maybe be part of your scope in, in the future you know um, in the future it could be um I know my colleague Joao Souza who's the expert on our team for a lot of this work he has talked in the past about having um a means to identify at the polymer level where um, a particular set of plastic comes from in terms of which you know which country which um, company et cetera et cetera so figuring that out as to where it's coming from I mean certainly if you're in Indonesia and you get a coca-cola bottle that's washed up on one of the islands you know how are you ever going to know where that comes from you know yeah. it's been thrown off a cruise ship it could have been you know in the current for years et cetera so identifying that and and taking that back to again you know the the producer's responsibility of these things the mm -hmm. You know the other countries' waste management issues. Um, that's quite complex, and yeah. um, I think it would be interesting, especially in light of what might happen with the Global Plastics Treaty, in terms of what does that mean in terms of acceding to it and, and the goals and the targets. I mean, how are you going to, you know, keep your beaches clean if you're continually getting things washed up on shore that are not from your country? And how do you, et cetera? It would be interesting to see where this goes in the next few years. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so we have another question uh, that has two likes from Renee. Uh, do you collect best practices in terms of solutions for mitigating the pollution, mainly for plastic in the ocean? Do we collect best practices for these? Yeah, so I guess for the, yeah, the solutions um, for mitigating pollution, so in, in the sense that there are probably lots of different projects and different people that are, are trying to, you know, do something um, in, in this space. And so if there are kind of, yeah, I guess advice for anyone who would like to start in a project, maybe. Yeah, so what we have done in the past is we have worked with the World Bank, for example, on assessing different um, methodologies for plastic pollution hotspotting and plastic pollution footprinting and things like that. Um, we don't have any particular best practice guidelines that we've produced, but what we do have is the set of tools that we've been using and promoting um, through UNEP and through um, you know, different partners, again, the World Bank included. And so we are, I think, you know, since we do work across lots of different partners, I mean, we've been engaged with the Alliance to End Plastic Waste on certain things. We work with the Basel Rotterdam Stockholm Conventions, et cetera, WWF, et cetera. We've got sort of a cross view of a lot of this work. So we don't actually produce something that says, you know, this is the best way to go. Um, certainly in terms of what we've produced with UNEP, we would, um, we would suggest people look at our modules and our tools and our guidance. Yeah. Um, but that said, um, we are producing a tool called Deplastify, which is a web-based tool that allows a country to go in, put in what kinds of plastic waste they have, and it provides a most suitable technology view of how to deal with it. So right. we're creating things like that, which aren't necessarily best practices, but they are means to you know, make decisions based on your situation. Right, yeah. Um, great, so hopefully, uh, Renee, that's answered your question. Um, let me know if I didn't interpret it correctly. Um, so next we have a question from Hannah uh, that also has two likes. So as you mentioned, the long report is not so easy for stakeholders to understand or turn into action. Are there other ways to communicate results to broad audiences? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think, um, let me find it real quick in here. One of the things that we try to do is produce, again, shorter reports that will show kind of exactly what to do with different, um, with different um, results that we've gotten. So in each of these reports, they come with a set of interventions. And it shows you within the tool, here's the guidance for the tool of how do you identify interventions and how do you prioritize them. And then when you start looking at them to select them, you end up with a set of interventions that is sort of higher priority will give you the most return on your investment. Um, and those interventions are then classified, and here we are. The primary, um, or sorry, the priority interventions list for Kenya, for example, are based on the type of the class, 
whether it's production, collection, waste infrastructure, et cetera. And we've given a set of interventions for each of those. And so what we try to do with all of this work is have it link, you know, linking it to the policy. This information, okay, so planning more frequent waste collection in areas prone to plastic waste leakage, that's pretty generic and that's pretty common sense. And most of our reports say things like that. But yeah. what we want to do is we want to take that and then look at the policies in Kenya and see how waste management is actually managed in Kenya. And then how does that tie into a marine litter um, action plan? How does it tie into a general litter action plan, a waste management plan? And how does it then get taken up into something that is actionable where people can actually say, we're now doing X in order to stop plastic from going into our environment. So it's a holistic view of you know, several steps, but they're all linked together. Right. Yeah. So hopefully, um, yeah, Hannah, if you can uh, let us know if there are any follow-up questions, but otherwise I, I, yeah, that's, that's, that's really useful, uh, Lynn. Okay. So um, next question, do you provide guidance on the prioritization of products for intervention? If so, what does it entail? So products for intervention, what does that I'm the, often not completely sure. Um, so so could, it could be, you know, what what are the main products that have the most the most impact on the environment, possibly, and which ones oh. should, you know should be uh, tackled first? For... Oh, I see. Okay, actually, that's the question. Then in this case, it's packaging, and this comes out throughout all of our. Um, reports that you see on these charts. Um, as you can see on this chart, for example, let me see if this is the right one. This is the application hotspot results from the data in Kenya. And if you look at the chart, which hopefully you can see, you've got bottles, lids, packaging, you know, plastic bags, diapers, drink bottles, boxes, and then all other packaging is this last big big um, bar here. And so we, in terms of the reports that we've generated um, and that are focused on the work we were doing through Marine Plastics, uh, the Marine Plastics Project, Mar Plastics, um, we do have that kind of guidance to say, okay, here's where the biggest problem is, whether it's packaging, whether it's tire residue for polymers, etc. cetera. Um, and those, um, those set of data then are plugged into the intervention data. Like if it is really a packaging issue, then those interventions are going to be higher once you're done running through the whole process of doing a hot spotting analysis. So yeah, there's lots. It's honestly throughout most of our work that we've seen, we've done regional reports for Asia and Africa on this work. It's packaging that shows up, you know, it's throwaway packaging everywhere. We just don't have the infrastructure. And then the other thing is some packaging, for example, food packaging, um, for example, in Thailand, the use of food packaging, the pa plastic can't be recycled and reused in food packaging. There's current legislation against that. So there's legislation that needs to be changed if we want to create again, a circular economy and not just have this be one-off plastic that's right. thrown away. So yeah, yeah packaging. <laughs> Yeah, and so that would be really looking at the um, the packaging industries and and you know changing then the actual yeah I guess the the actual materials that are used to to build yeah and to create these these products mm. right and a lot of research is happening. In fact, there are several calls through the EU um, from some other I think it's Horizon funding. I'm not sure of packaging that is created out of um, other materials that are biodegradable. There's a lot of work going on in that realm as well that IUCN is not part of necessarily at this point, but um, alternative packaging and how it's used. And then also, again, shifting the policies that you can recycle a plastic packaging piece into something that is used again for food later. But again, there's food regulations involved in this too. So it's Yeah, exactly. And then it, if, if you just shift all plastic to being, you know, kind of made of sugarcane, then you're going to have problems with sugarcane plantation. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, it's a, yeah, a delicate topic to, to be discussed a lot. Absolutely. 
Okay, um, and now Audrey has another question. Um, do you use any ocean data? It looks like you only look at inland plastic. Did you study coastlines in a specific um, way as plastic can be displaced by the ocean? We do, in fact, and in our economic um, briefs, I can show you briefly, for example, um, within the economic brief that is the case study on net fisheries in Thailand related to plastics, the um, research that was done on this includes, as I get down to the page, sorry about this. Um, we looked at, for example, um, you know, the different parts of the Gulf of Thailand, the exclusive economic zones, the, um, you know, just a sec, there's another really good chart in this, in this, um, it talks about, you know, where turtles are found, where um, dolphins are found, um, the impact on the biodiversity, et cetera. So we look at distribution of the animals. We tie a lot of this, um, a lot of the economics work is also tied into understanding the red list data that I use in house for endangered and vulnerable and critically endangered species, et cetera. Right. And then again, that's linked back to where the plastic is being found. Um, mm -hmm. So there's that. In the um, national reports that we've done on the plastics hotspotting, yes, there are coastal and fisheries um, assessments in some of them. And there is um, some ocean data that is in there. It's um, primarily coastal. Um, focus. Right, and, and primarily species. So really trying to look at the impacts on the wildlife. Right, right. And we do use, um, in order to build, for example, the geographic maps that you'll see, we do use the, um, you know, the hydrographic GIS layers and things to understand where the water is flowing and, you know, the, the rate the water is flowing at, et cetera. And then taking into account things like um, monsoon seasons and the, the rainy seasons where there is an additional amount of water going through that's flushing into the ocean, all of the, the river plastic, et cetera. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, um, hopefully Audrey, that, that answered your question. Um, now there's another question um, from Anonymous. So when you say stakeholder influence from, for example, in the Mar Plastics um, project, what are examples of these actions in that graph that you showed? Um, okay, so that I can share with you. Um, in terms of our outcomes, um, let me... So you briefly, we've got on our outcomes page, we've created a dashboard that, um, hang on just a sec, let me scroll down through this. Um, we have tracked for this particular project over its four years, the different results areas and who's been involved in that change. And so the graph that I showed was actually from this graph and or from this um, dashboard. Mm -hmm. And we talk a little bit about business capacity and the stakeholders that we've influenced. So specifically, as you can see here, let me move my, my Zoom page over here. As you can see here, Throughout the whole four years of this project, we were involved with 35 different government um, stakeholders, whether it was, um, you know, ministry level, whether it was local level, national level, etc. Mm -hmm. So these are the types of people we engaged in this project. The project had a national steering committee mm -hmm. set up in all five countries in Kenya, Mozambique, South Africa. Um, Thailand and Vietnam, and the national steering committees were made up of the stakeholders from academia, some advisors and consultants, um, people that have worked, you know, for years on the marine plastic issue in each country, um, some nonprofit representatives, um, some other intergovernmental agencies as well, um, you know, the private sector, business units, things like that. So we've managed to, um, over the time period, you know, really convene a lot of these different stakeholders and, you know, share with them the knowledge, um, invite them to, you know, look at these reports. All of these reports that we have online were validated by the National Steering Committee members, which includes, you know, representatives from each of these groups. And, you know, were really questioned. And then, of course, in the case of 
um, the five reports from our plastics, they've all been used to start developing or um, contribute to the development of um, marine litter management plans in each country. So um, that's really how we've done this. I mean, IUCN's main, um, like one of their main, uh, how do you say this, um, really positive things that we do is our, we have this convening power that we can bring together right. with governments, regional um, conventions, the Nairobi Convention, the Abidjan Convention, um, you know, we work at the UNEA level, but we also have this local to global level of work mm -hmm. that um, sets the structure for how we actually achieve the things we're trying to achieve. Right. And just out of curiosity, how do you actually communicate with these different actors? Is it kind of like you send a survey and you ask them the same questions or do you try to have meetings, you know, like online meetings with them or yeah. So it, it really depends. Um, for example, in the um, situation of the national stakeholders, they were an established entity and they met at least once a year and they reviewed the work we were doing. And that was through emails and, you know, webinars and when we could meet in person, in-person meetings, um, et cetera. For examples like the economics um, data that we've used for the economics briefs, that came through um, actual in-person surveys in some cases that were done around to the Fisher people. Um, Sometimes we've done external, you know, like sort of a broad survey of people externally. The business and private sector work has been um, very interesting in that we've worked within the BCSD networks, um, which are the Business Council on Sustainable Development in a lot of these countries with the plastics associations, plastics producers, things like that. And we've brought people together to attend a webinar and to learn about the Plastic Leak Project or um, you know, the tools we're producing through Plastic Waste Free Islands, you know, bringing together the tourism operators, right. the waste management operators, things like that, so that they actually can understand what we're doing and somehow be involved. So it's, it's about project setup from the beginning and making sure the, the right people are involved, but it's also about having a strong communications plan in place so that as you progress through the project, you know, you're sharing this with a wider audience and it's not just going out into a void. <laughs> it's actually right. people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and defining these, these actors or stakeholders, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of jumping in front of some of the other questions that are here on the uh, slider, but um, I'm, I'm just curious about this, this whole process, you know, so um how do you actually decide who to include in this, you know, this uh, this first phase, I guess, of the of the pro project? I think it depends. I mean, for example, in a lot of the IUCN countries where we've done work, we've been doing this work for a while, so we have a set of stakeholders already engaged. You know, again, we work with two hundred and eleven plus um, national governments and local governments. We work across 160 countries with NGOs. I mean, we have a very broad and very deep network. And I think it's really, um, it depends on the project. Like for example, when we start thinking about designing a new project, um, we will generally engage with the IUCN office in that country first, and, yeah. um, or they'll come to us. You know, it can be both ways. It's not just the folks at the at the headquarters level going you know reaching out it can be both ways mm -hmm. and so it will be really around that sort of communication and then trying to fit you know the stakeholders that are already participating in our work into this and then if we can't find stakeholders that are already doing a lot of this work with us then we go to our networks and you know start finding the right people to invite so there's a lot of outreach and a lot of um, engagement that way Right. Yeah. 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 Very cool. All right. So the next question, um, have you been approached by users that wanted to use your material and weren't part of your expected users list? Um, so yes. And, and no, um, so <laughs> we have been approached by several, um, well, a few plastic pacts um, in different countries. And the plastic pacts are those, um, for example, that are part of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation plastic pacts. Mm -hmm. um, we have been approached by certain countries um, 
well, their director, what's it called? The um, inspector general offices where they do some research and development on, on data. Um, we have been approached by consultants that were already using our methodology um, in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Um, they were doing this project for um, the World Bank to study the, the situation of plastics in South Asia. And so we were approached by them because they started to have questions about how to use certain things and how do some of the tools work and how do you get the GIS tools to work on a small island because there's no rivers on a small island and it doesn't really work because you need hydrographic data and how do you adjust things like this? And so we have been um, asked about that. In terms of preferred users that we'd like to see using this, um, I think generally it's, you know, it can be scaled down to a local level or scaled up even to a regional level. Mm -hmm. um, we do have interest from a number of countries that we haven't studied yet, but a lot of the work that is going into this, um, you know, needs to be really, I guess, formalized into projects. And so mm -hmm. um, we also work with our partners um, that um, did a lot of this work, um, Qantas EA, their database called Plastiques is something that is, you know, that they're taking um, this methodology and really, you know, going um, to different countries as well and creating these sort mm -hmm. of as well. So there are others that are using them and producing data and sharing it and things like that. And certainly um, even the Alliance 10 Plastic Waste has incorporated our eight reports into their database as well. So great. Yeah. 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 Really nice. And um, okay, so let's see the next question. So um, yeah, Hannah has come back with another question. You mentioned a focus on outcome harvesting and monitoring. Does this include quantities of plastic managed and diverted? Uh, how is this measured? Absolutely. So I can show you really quick too. Um, again, we... Um, We've worked, for example, with our circular economy projects um, in this particular project from our plastics again. Um, we've worked with um, several on the ground, small medium enterprises um, in the different countries to specifically you know, fund them and support them for a short period of time and get them to be sustainable with their um, their businesses in terms of recycling and preventative um, measures to you know, keep the plastic out of the ocean. And so what we've done in terms of this is we've worked with these five organizations and measured exactly who's working on the project, how much waste they've been collecting each year, how much can really be said to be not going into the ocean. So if it's collected, it's not going into the ocean. Our latest outcome harvesting report that we did in December for this particular project showed that across five countries, it was over 240,000 kilograms of plastic prevented from going into the ocean across five countries. So we do monitor that through this, but also within our other projects that we're working on, you know, depending on the scope of the project, um, it can also be measured directly and say, okay, we've now upcycled X amount of plastic into benches or chairs, et cetera. So right. it's not going into the ocean. So there are monitoring um, aspects of those other projects too. And I have one quick question, um, follow-up question on that. So, um, you know, I, I sometimes think about these, these projects that are basically upcycling and that are, you know, taking the, the plastic waste and if they see it can be recycled to create a new product, a new item. And is there actually a project in place or some form of monitoring to see that that new item is then disposed of correctly or, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and that's actually within, um, I'm not entirely familiar with this aspect of the project, but within the alternate value chains that we're doing in the Plastic Waste Free Islands project, um, making sure that those materials don't end up sitting somewhere and leaching or getting bleached and, you know, again, going back into the environment. So there okay. are aspects of that for our work that I know that Joao again, and my colleague, he's been very keen on this. It's like, okay, it's great if you're going to make these things, but if they turn into something that is a problem that is leaching or is degrading exactly. in some way, what's the point? Yeah, it's just delaying the, the problem, right? Exactly, yeah. exactly. 
Mm -hmm. and yeah, no, it is something we are conscious of and it's something that we are very, um, I think with anything we do, the solutions that we provide and what we're trying to think about in terms of things like bottle to bottle recycling and how do you, how do you reuse things, taking them out of the environment, you know, putting them into this circular economy where they don't ever get into the environment to leak. That's really, you know, I think the bigger goal of a lot of this work. Yeah. 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 And it's great to be doing it in countries where, you know, cause in the Netherlands, for example, there is this, this aim to be fully in a circular economy um, mm -hmm. system by 2050. Um, and, you know, that's in one of the places where they've got the best recycling in the world. Right. So mm -hmm. um, it's, it's obviously really, really important to bring these things that are working and that can be applied to other countries. Um, Absolutely. To, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that's why we work, for example, with the Prevent Waste Alliance, which is part of GIZ's programs on this. And they talk about not just um, circular economy for plastics, but also the waste issues around e-waste, um, et cetera. And so it's really preventing the waste and mm -hmm. thinking about how do you keep it within the, the cycle of the right. economy and not, you know, sitting on the side of the road somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, I see that Renee, you're uh, you're pleased with the way that we interpreted your your question. So that's great. Um, <laughs> and there's one last question. So this is also from anonymous. Um, what's the biggest issue preventing knowledge of uh, of the plastic problem being turned into policy by the countries IUCN have worked with. And yeah, it's actually not anonymous. It's Patrick from Common Seas who asks. Oh, okay. So the biggest blocker that's preventing, so the work we've been doing, the knowledge and the, the uptake for the policies, um, I would say it's a series of things. I think um, a combination of, you know, in some cases it's political will, um, in some cases, it's economics. I mean, honestly, COVID and building back better after COVID is a focus of a lot of um, countries, you know, goals after this. But, you know, it's, it's really being able to say, okay, how do we tackle this big problem and having the right guidance in place to look at things from a step by step um, process is one thing that would help prevent that. But it's, it's, it's a combination of all of these things. It's consumer awareness, but it's not, you know, putting the whole burden on the consumer. It needs to be mm -hmm. implementing things like EPR. How do you implement EPR in a country whose other infrastructure and systems are not as advanced? I mean, how mm -hmm. do you move countries along so that they can use tools that are appropriate for their situation and that will have this, you know, cost-effective real results for mitigating or eliminating plastic pollution? Um, I would say, you know, and we, we do monitor things like knowledge uptake. Like if we have a, an item that we've shared with a government agency and, and it gets reshared on their website, we do monitor that. I mean, we obviously can't tell who's downloading it off of their websites, but, but we do think of, you know, these things in terms of how do we get this knowledge out there? Mm -hmm. um, and really it's about having a champion within usually um, one of the ministries or one of the, you know, the leaders of an NGO that's really powerful in a country, mm -hmm. getting them to buy into it and, you know, helping to make that change. Um, and then of course, again, leveraging our, our networks where we can and trying to really um, influence at lots of levels. I mean, we have a global policy group and we are, IUCN is very, very focused on global policy mm -hmm. and working at the UNEA, the UN, the, you know, the convention levels um, to change things and then having that roll down to regional and national levels. And then also working from the local and, you know, subnational and national levels to make change too. It's kind of a combination of both getting the right people involved to push things in the right direction right yeah yeah so we have uh, a minute left do you have any kind of closing comments or or remarks um any advice or yeah something you would like to close with um, i don't think i have any advice i would just like to say um you know if you are interested you're welcome to email me um my email is lynn.sorrentino at iucn.org and i know this is on youtube so i'm really hoping i don't get a lot of spam 
<laughs> um, that's why I didn't put it in my slides. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions, and I'm really excited that people joined today. And I hope that this, you know, ex, you know, sort of explained a lot of what IUCN's Ocean Team does now. And yeah, and a lot of resources that you have, right, yeah. that can be used. Yeah. So, so that's really great. Yeah. Happy thank to. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, thank, thank you. It's been thank you a lot, Lynn. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, I think we can close this off here. Uh, thanks everyone for for joining, and we will send out an email for the next webinar that will be next month. All right, thanks a lot, Lynn. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye everyone.